to Jim Clyburn. I, I, I'm a congresswoman. Thank you for everything. Alright everyone, if we could have people start getting to their seats, that would be much appreciated so we can get the program started. Please take your seats at this time, thank you.
are delighted to see all of you. As you know, we just finished voting, so people are making their way in this direction. We have one of our leaders of the Congress who has a book signing that starts at 6.30. <laughs> and so I'm going to ask him to make remarks at the beginning. Uh, Representative Jim Clyburn, who is uh, assistant to the leader, come. our former whip. You didn't hear me introduce you, did you? Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Eddie Benice, for uh, allowing me to go uh, at the top of this uh, program rather than at the end. Uh, I'm listed on the program to bring reflections. and. Uh, I said to Ed Benice, I had previously scheduled a uh, book signing event for this evening, uh, and uh, I apologize for having to interrupt the flow. But I'm going to thank her and uh, my longtime friend John Lewis and my friend Corinne Brown for having the forethought uh, to have this panel discussion uh, this uh, evening. Uh, and to honor uh, one who I feel uh, will go down in history if he has not already as one of the greatest presidents of all times. Someone asked me earlier today, uh, did I feel uh, that um, uh, Lyndon Johnson was able to accomplish uh, what no other president could have accomplished? And, why did I feel that way? And I said to them that it has a little bit to do with the title I gave to my memoirs recently uh, released. I call it Blessed Experiences uh, because I believe sincerely that all of us are but the sum total of our experiences. And I believe that Lyndon Johnson internalized his early experiences as a public school teacher uh, in rural Texas. And that experience allowed him uh, to approach those issues in 1964 and 65 and 68 in a way that nobody else could. And I am pleased uh, that we are here today to have some reflections uh, on those experiences. Uh, and I want to close by saying to you, just remember that we've been here before. And we revisited all of this in 1964 because, for some strange reason, we forgot to be vigilant. And I used to teach history, and I used to tell my students that anything that has happened before can happen again. And when we leave this place, after all of the rededication and the reflection, let us resolve to redouble our efforts to get this new assault on voting rights addressed, to get this new assault on voter uh, education addressed, and to get these new legislative approaches that we are beginning to experience, make sure that we do not allow the clock to get turned back on the issues we're all here to celebrate today. So thank you so much for coming, and thank you, my dear classmate, Eddie Benice Johnson. I won't tell you how long we've known each other, uh, but we have been here in this Congress almost 22 years together, and she is absolutely one of my closest friends, and I thank her so much uh, for bringing us together here uh, this evening. I was has, I'm trying to see if Congressman John Lewis has arrived yet, I guess. I know he's on his way. Uh, we all ran into a crowd as we were leaving votes. I didn't wait for the last vote to be over. I just hit my card and came. But we'll go ahead and get started so that you'll have time to visit with each other. 
We are delighted that you've joined us during this very special commemorating uh, the President Lyndon Rain Johnson's and the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And I'm very honored to have distinguished guests with us tonight, Democrat and Republican members of both the House and Senate, and former members of the Johnson administration as our special guests. I know that before the evening is over, Speaker John Boehner is to come, Leader Nancy Pelosi, U.S. Senators, I know I saw U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown, uh, Mr. Roger Wicker, and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse had indicated their ability to attend. Dr. James Billington of the library, I shook his hand just a few minutes ago. He's probably somewhere doing a little bit of work. Ambassadors James Jones, Ambassador Lord Hand, Robert Codette, and Ambassador Andrew Young. I know he's on his way because I just shook his hand a little while ago. Reverend Jesse Jackson and Martin Luther King III. We're pleased that you've joined us and most especially pleased that Mrs. Linda Bird Johnson Robb, uh, former First Lady of the State of Virginia and her husband, former Governor and former Senator Chuck Robb. We're delighted that you've come. And I want to share with you that I had at least a 30-minute conversation with Lucy, telling me why she couldn't come today. And, uh, you know, we go back a long way. Uh, we, will, we will acknowledge all members of the Congressional Black Caucus and the leadership roles that they hold. Uh, Congresswoman Corrine Brown, who is co-chairing, uh, along with Mr. John Lewis, the occasion this evening, will have that responsibility a little bit later. Uh, it is often heralded that victory has many fathers. And that's especially true when we look back upon the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, many of you attended the beautiful ceremony honoring the life and legacy of Dr. and Mrs. King earlier today. Fittingly, they were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal, which they so richly deserve for dedicating their lives to the fight for justice and equality. In Robert Carroll's book, The Years of Lyndon Johnson, master of the Senate, he quotes President Lyndon Baines Johnson as saying, I do understand power. Whatever else may be said about me, I know where to look for it and how to use it. That he does, did know how to do. Men such as Dr. Martin Luther King and President Lyndon Johnson both had a great deal of power and they used it to reshape our nation. President Johnson used the full power of his office to address the injustices of discrimination in America by advancing two of the most significant legislative endeavors in this nation's history, passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. These historic bills outlawed racial segregation and discrimination in voting paving the way for a stronger, more united nation, one that was united under equal justice for every American, regardless of race, color, or creed. And you've heard this phrase, are we there yet? No, we're not. But without these two pieces of legislation, we would not be where we are. I can tell you that without the enactment of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, I would not be a member of Congress, and not would many of my colleagues in, be in Congress today. We would not have that opportunity, and it wouldn't be such a group called the Congressional Black Caucus, the conscious of the Congress. I should also note, however, that we are not there. We are not where we ought to be. But it's our hope tonight that during this panel discussion, we are all able to take away the important lessons of President Johnson's role in the bipartisan passage of the Civil Rights Act, 
These are lessons that would benefit us all as we address today's civil rights issues. While our goal is to honor President Johnson and to reflect upon his legacy, it is my sincerest hope that as elected officials, community leaders, and friends, we are reminded of all of our power and the power of our offices. I hope we are encouraged and energized to work together more closely beyond party lines and to use our collective power to continue the fight for justice. That's the only way we can give homage and respect for the leadership of President Lyndon James Johnson. Despite the current climate, when it seems hopeless, when it's especially risky to challenge the outliers, and when it appears that we are fighting a lost cause, it is our patriotic duty to continue to fight. As we look back over our history, we know that we have a good example. It wasn't easy for President Johnson. It wasn't easy for Dr. King and the other heroes of the civil rights movement. And it will not and won't be easy now for all of us. As President Johnson said at the signing of the Civil Rights Act, we must work together. We must align our compassion and ambition so that we can be a force for justice and adv advancement. I am ready to fight standing side by side with all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle who will stand for what is right, what is moral, what is just. I hope you are ready to stand with me, and I especially want you to share with me tonight uh, this distinguished panel. I'm pleased to introduce the moderator of the evening's panel discussion, Mr. Tom Johnson. In addition to being a personal friend of mine, he was one of President Johnson's greatest protégés. As a matter of fact, there are two of them up here. One, President Johnson said, would be present one day, and his name is Ben Barnes. There's one that's not here. That's because he's in Minnesota tonight, speaking at the Hubert Humphrey Institute, that he said would be the first black president, Vernon Jordan. But I'm pleased to introduce the moderator, Mr. Tom Johnson, who served not only as assistant press secretary, but speechwriter, and he became one of the president's most trusted advisors and friends. He has an extensive journalistic background. He was the executive vice president of the Texas Broadcasting Corporation, the executive editor and publisher of the Dallas Times Herald and the Los Angeles Times <clears throat> before becoming president of CNN. He now serves as chairman emeritus of the board of the LBJ Foundation and retired president of CNN, Tom Johnson. Good afternoon. First, let me indicate that there are additional seats up front and here in the middle. So for those of you who would prefer to be seated rather than standing, please make your way on up here. We, we will try to make this an interesting program, but it may not be interesting enough for those of you who just need to stand throughout it. First, uh, I'd just like to thank Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, Congresswoman Corrine Brown, and especially Congressman John Lewis, for organizing this forum in partnership with the Congressional Black Caucus. And I see we have the head of the Congressional Black Caucus and also the Faith and Politics uh, Institute. Very few laws in American history change this nation as significantly as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And I think it's important to remember throughout it all, it took Dr. Martin Luther King and President Johnson and many others to pass those extraordinarily controversial pieces of legislation 50 years ago. It took bipartisanship, women and men of both parties who joined together to do it. How badly we need that spirit of bipartisanship today. 
We have assembled a remarkable panel, I think, to discuss the life and the times of President Johnson and the history of the passage of the Civil Rights Bill of 64. No living American is better qualified to discuss this era than Congressman John Lewis, who, as you know, survived a brutal attack in Selma on Bloody Sunday, 1965, as he marched to achieve justice for all Americans. Journalist Todd Purdom is author of An Idea Whose Time Has Come, Two Presidents, Two Parties, and the Battle for the Civil Rights Act of 64. Texan Nick Kotz is author of Judgment Days, Lyndon Baines Johnson, Martin Luther King, and the Laws That Changed America. And as Eddie Bernice said, Ben Barnes. Ben was elected to the Texas legislature at age 22. At age 26, he was elected the youngest ever lieutenant governor of Texas. He was very much a protege of President Johnson and of Texas Governor John Conley. Much of Ben's career has been exemplified by deep loyalty to the life and legacy of President Johnson. Nobody, with the possible exception of Linda Johnson Robb, knew LBJ better. Now to open, I'm going to ask Congressman Lewis. Congressman, on page 431 of Judgment Days, as a quote that said, we no longer have the coalition, the coalition of conscience that we had in the 60s, a bipartisan group that we had then in Congress that was dedicated to justice. What happened? Well, I, thank you, Tom. First of all, I want to thank my uh, friends and colleagues, especially Eddie Bernice Johnson, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, and Congresswoman Corrine Brown for having this idea to salute President Johnson, 50th anniversary of the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. You're right, Tom, and uh, we did have a coalition of conscience. I think I said it back then. Right, Nick? I did say that, right? Yes, sir. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I truly believe we did have a coalition of conscience. There were blacks and whites, Democrats and Republicans coming together. When we came to Washington, D.C. on the morning of August 28, 1963, when I was only 23 years old, had all of my hair and a few pounds lighter <laughs> congressional office, you will see a picture with Everett Durkis, Martin Luther King, A. Phil Randolph, and others, and young John Lewis were all standing there together. Some of the photographs from the March on Washington, August 28, 1963, you saw church groups, you saw Protestant, Catholic, and Jews, People from different. It was not just African American leadership. But after the six of us met with President Kennedy and told him we were going to march on Washington, we invited four major white religious prince of the American Jewish Congress. There was Eugene Carson Blake. Some of us remember on one accord. And when we marched, we marched together. When we prayed, we prayed together. People were beaten together. The first 1964, coalition of conscience. But someplace along the way, after the signing of the Civil Rights Act, July 2nd, right? 1964, and other Internet, the presidency of Lyndon Johnson, who stood up meaningful speeches than any American president had made in modern time. That's the speech we call the We Shall Overcome speech. People were ready. So we witnessed the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. 
the assassination of Robert Kennedy. And just maybe people said we cannot hope, we cannot have faith anymore. But the movement taught us to have faith, to believe, and never to give up, never to give in, to be hopeful and to be optimistic. Getting the voting rights site renewed and come together like we did during the 60s. House 290 to 130, and it passed the Senate 73 to 27, with 27 out of 33 Republican votes. What kind of measure could pass the Senate by that uh, margin today? I'm not sure they could agree on this. It wasn't divided. Right. People still knew each other. They respected each other as human beings. Their families and children knew each other. They worked here more than three days a week. They had friendships, genuine friendships, across the aisle. S President Johnson and Senator Dirksen were, Senator Johnson said, hold on, Ev, my other line is ringing. <laughs> um, but they knew each other as human beings. And I think that one of the things that got lost along the way in the 90s when Speaker Gingrich told members, freshman members, you know, don't move to Washington. Stay at home in your districts. Don't get to know your uh, people here. Uh, I think that's something that's around strange, and I hope I don't get struck dead for saying it in such an august building. But it's also quite clear to me that this bill would never have been passed without alcohol. Uh, pe people drank all day in both houses of Congress, and they drank a lot. <laughs> Senator Dirksen, the crucial negotiations for this bill took place in a private office in the back of Senator Dirksen's. Those things may sound somewhat trivial, but I think one of the lessons of the bill is that President Kennedy elevated this cause to a moral cause. He said on June 11th when he proposed the bill, it's as old as the scriptures and as clear as the American Constitution. And Senator Russell of Georgia, who was the leading opponent of the bill, said famously, we could have beat the lawyers, we couldn't beat the churches. And so I extraordinary moments of grace in the whole story is on the night the Senate voted for cloture and it was clear that the bill would pass. The person who walked Senator Russell, he did that and Senator Russell said to him, you know Clarence, because we had our say and we lost fair and square, we'll go home and this law will be enforceable and it'll be the law of the land and it's our duty to obey it. And I think that kind of, that kind of partnership, <laughs> even with your enemies, is something to really remember. Pick up on that. They seem to be different, the odd couple. Lyndon Johnson, the wheeler dealer arm twister who could control the Senate, Martin Luther King, the soaring orator and minister. But if you look at what happened starting on November 22, 1963, and you look very carefully at Lyndon Johnson and Martin Luther King, you see how they came together at a critical moment in history and beside, but behind the scenes worked together to pass the 60s, starting from their first meeting on November 26th after the Kennedy assassination. You see something different you see that President Johnson had a passion for equality in passing this. He shouldn't go all out on the Civil Rights Bill. It was not the right thing to start with. He should start with the tax bill. And President Johnson said, well, what's the presidency for? He was president now and all the past history from the time he was a junior member of Congress, a member of the Senate, the rights leaders said to the president, he was in the office with President Johnson. Johnson was busy on the telephone lobbying members of Congress. He said, why are you doing this? And the president replied, he knew that he was president and this was his moment. Martin Luther King was far more than a soaring orator and a brave leader of men. He was a brilliant organizer, a brilliant strategist and tactician as he led the troops of his coalition. Johnson and King knew that they needed each other and thought everything should be done uh, in, 
in his office or the halls of Congress. He never criticized Dr. Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King. He never criticized the demonstrators. And Martin Luther King, no matter what was going on, if the bill got stalled, if the president wasn't six when they met, and both of them had the same thing to say, that the death of President Kennedy and him becoming a martyr created a great opportunity to, in a good sense, take advantage of the martyrization of President Kennedy to pass this legislation. They said it to each other. When it was all over, the two men met, and Martin Luther King said to President Johnson, you have led a successful revolution. They were together all the way through the 65 Civil Rights Act. And then came the Vietnam War, about which they differed. And then came a change in Congress where the Congress was no longer in a mood to pass social legislation, the war on poverty. And Johnson and King. Ben Barnes, you were elected the youngest speaker of the Texas House, uh, became the youngest uh, lieutenant governor in the state of Texas. You were in Texas as a close advisor to John Conley and a very much a protege of, of, of President Johnson. What was it like with the political upheaval? That, uh, I'm very eager to hear what Ben Barnes has to say, uh, but I may, may have to hear it from the back of the room because uh, tonight we have a big event on pedi pediatric AIDS. I heard the question asked, what would it take to pass the Voting Rights Act today, which is what we need to do? Well, uh, President Lincoln said to abolish slavery, and he tempered Others were impatient, they wanted him to go faster. He had to go when he had the public sentiment at the right place. And when you're talking about Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, President Lyndon Johnson, that was the perfect combination of outside mobilization and prayer and public opinion and inside a master at work getting the job done using his bully pulpit, but also uh, reflecting the centennial of the, pres of the president's birth uh, in the capital of the United States. We, many of us members of Congress who were there took great pride in the fact that the president had served in the House of Representatives and we thought that gave him an understanding of another branch of government because he was the master of the Senate, of course. But it, it was, uh, there's just one quote when he did the great society that I love. He said, he was at the University of Michigan, he told the crowd assembled, we have the power to shape the civilization that we want. That was kind of a bold statement. And uh, some might have thought it was, you know, Texas style, big and bold and the rest. Great society. They did so much, whether it was uh, uh, elementary and secondary education, whether it was higher education, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, but the one I want to focus on, on is Medicare which made a complete difference in our country for our seniors. All of his bills were bill. He went to Independence, Missouri, in the presence of President Truman and Mrs. Truman to sign the bill there and to give President Truman credit for starting that whole debate. He was so big. He was really so secure that he could share. these. And when, that's when they were doing uh, fair housing and the rest of that, and to get to the point that has been made here, Dr. King, when he would come to Baltimore, it was like the parting of the waves. I told the family today, it was like the parting of the waves. This incredible semicolon question, uh, exclamation point of what was in the bills and what was possible to do 
and what was a bridge too far. Similar to saying we can't do voting rights. Impressive was how people just revered him. He was the man when he came to town. Similarly, when President Lyndon Johnson came, he too, while of greater height and stature, nonetheless, when he showed up, when some of us first met him uh, as President of the United States, this imposing figure whose goals, whose accomplishments, whose talent to get the job done matched the physical presence uh, of the person. So I'm so happy that on this 50th anniversary, that as we praise the work of Reverend Martin Luther King and Credit Scott King, as we did earlier today, uh, that there is, uh, as we went along, and uh, that the recognition that Lyndon Johnson deserves is finally in a, in a fuller measure. He's always received recognition, but in a fuller measure, uh, Eddie Bernice Johnson and Corinne Brown and John Lewis, of course. What an honor for all of us to serve with John Lewis, of course, uh, to uh, how you think of them. But the fact is, the American people are our bosses, and that's who we have to persuade. And that's why it's really important for us to be able to have a clear shot at the, a, a, a way of speaking to the American people, not suppressed by endless there uh, on the Civil Rights Bill or the Voting Rights Bill. But again, Lincoln had it right. Public sentiment is everything. They're the boss. They're very wise. And they knew at the time that our country was finished. He was reelected. The whole agenda was validated. I thank you all tonight for paying thank tribute to all you. of that. And I know. And thank you um, for yielding your time. Well, Tom, thanks for repeating that question. I was still carried away by Speaker Pelosi's inspirational speech. I'd forgotten the question. Thanks for repeating that. <laughs> President Johnson understood full well what was happening. I, he said civil rights was going to have uh, on the country and going to have on his political party. The fact that the impression that it was going to have on impact it was going to have on his political career and a lot of other political careers. I, but I, I wasn't young enough to make the cut. I mean, I wasn't old enough to make the cut, Jesse. You made the cut. You got invited. But, but Marvin Watson, the chief of staff of, the, of President Johnson at that time, called and found that I was in town with a group of young legislators, uh, John West. We were all young at that time, and we were meeting in the Southern legislative leaders. And I got a call and said, please come and meet Dr. King, Dr. Abernathy, be there for the signing of the bill. And that was great. But I said, I told Marvin Watson, I cannot leave these other leaders here because they're going to be really mad at me if, they, if I go to the White House and they don't. But he said, bring them all. So I brought all the, these young people that all thought we were going to be president someday or leaders of the free world, and most of them were senators or governors, but Chuck Robb. But uh, we go to the White House and meet Dr. King and Dr. Abernathy, and it's a great crowd. I tell you, I'm with my colleagues, I said, you see the president wave at me? He knows me. And, but here he comes. The signing, I've signed the Civil Rights Bill, and now I'm signing the Voting Rights Bill. And my signing this bill and, become, and, and becoming law than my being reelected or any of you being elected to any office that you've got to do everything you can to make sure that these tubes he turned around and by that time I backed up against the wall he put his long arms out like that and but now my southerners my friends from they're saying my god what in the world Barnes is getting his tail to shoot out about something but I, I, he said to me Ben and another thing you're young enough that someday there's going to be a black person nominated president of the United States. And if that ever happens, you work your butt off because a black president will not. <laughs> 50 years ago, Lyndon Johnson said those words. I had a chance to tell that story in, in, at President Obama's own campaign at Texas State University where President Johnson went to, went to school and, and young uh, Joe Kennedy is in the back room. He, he drew the short straw and had to introduce me that day. But Lyndon Johnson knew Tom. Now this panel is uh, hopefully an interactive panel where we will have the opportunity to take your questions. There are going to be mics in the room. I do have one person though who wanted to share some reflections and be happy to take questions. Reverend Jesse Jackson. 
I am want to express my thanks to Sister Ella Bernice Johnson, herself a Texan, and to a uh, uh, tall Texan from Florida, Sister Corrine. Let me say that, kind of dealing with this first question, I remember Dr. King saying that once he got the, the Nobel Peace Prize and President Johnson gave him a White House reception. I, 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 Dr. King, I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that, but the fact of the matter is, I want to, but I can't. Congress can, but it won't. You really probably can't get it. I remember he and the, and the young walking out of the White House saying that we must go to Selma and create a climate. What concerns me so much now is that Jefferson Davis Democrats became Goldwater Reagan Republicans and changed uniforms but did not change their character. And Lincoln Republicans became Kennedy Johnson Democrats. It's a complete switch. I was in Oklahoma a few days ago. Uh, a, a tornado had come through and it killed seven children, seven white children. And so two of the ladies came and said, Reverend, say, we want you to help us get this tornado bill passed, but us as Republicans, and I know it, I, don't, I said, I don't mind you being a Republican. She said, but I thought I'd be truthful with you because I, I was a Republican. I said, ma'am, I understand. I said, we want to get, I said, but uh, you like Social Security? She said, yes, sir. I said, what about Medicare? She said, yeah, I'm with that too. I said, what about vacation? I said, ma'am, you as a Democrat, you just don't know what you are. <laughs> but this fundamental shift took place, so much so that as we look at the review mirror and talk a bit about uh, two things. One. I, I, I cannot be satisfied that the Bernice until that is the King Johnson gold coin. Because if Dr. King speaks August 28th, 1963, I have a dream and projects what it ought to be. Johnson speaks January 8th, 1964. He answers the dream with legislation. The dream minus legislation would have been when? There would be no stuff phase of the substance of things hoped for. The substance is the legislation. The dream minus legis the dream plus when it turns into public accommodations and the right to vote and food stamps and fair housing, when the dream becomes substance, then the dream takes on a different dimension. And I, I would think that uh, there are those who well, you know but about the Vietnam War. Let me put this this way. I've said this to Tom Johnson. In a nine inning ball game. You hit some and you drop some. You miss some. He had a bad seventh inning. He couldn't stop a war he didn't start. Like most folks can't stop wars they don't start, given our sense of national ego. But at the end of nine innings, Johnson is a winner. When, you, when the Republicans sitting at the tea in their cup come from Lyndon Johnson. Their breakfast program come from Lyndon Johnson. There could be no Dallas Cowboys and Houston, Texas without Lyndon Johnson. There could be no uh, uh, Carolina Panthers and Atlanta Falcons without Lyndon Johnson. There could be no CNN in Atlanta without Lyndon Johnson. There could be no Super Bowl in New Orleans. There could be no Spurs and Heat playing in Texas and Florida without Lyndon Johnson. He is the great transfer. Only Lincoln is as tall as Lyndon Johnson. And of course, that's because he saved us from secession and the slavery. But Johnson passed more legislation than Lincoln did. Now, I would think we would do ourselves well. Uh, we'll we're old enough now to put in perspective that this man is a great leader, and you tell a tree not by the bark it wears, but by the fruit it bears. And I would simply say this to you, that we live in our faith. We live under the law. That the king was a man of faith. We live in our faith. We have your faith made, but we live under the law. We do not live under the dream. The dream is not under attack. Today, the 11 southern states have become confederates again. So I go to South Carolina to see my mom and, and, and Yolanda, state one-fourth poverty. The governor sends $11 billion back to Washington, $11 billion, because it's come from Washington. She's about to close South Carolina State, about $12 million she sends back, a $1 billion in education money, because it's federal money, as if we don't pay federal taxes. Georgia sends back, rejects $10 billion in Medicaid money. Uh, Texas sends back a hundred billion dollars. The entire Confederate agenda is now in full swing. Attacking the Voting Rights Act, 
attacking access to health care and education. So in many ways, the right wing, what happened to the coalition, John? When we won, it's not so much as when they say President Barack won, that's, that's beyond race, and that's really beyond Selma. Because if the Voting Rights Act was not just for blacks. Blacks got the right to vote. White women couldn't serve on juries. 18 year olds couldn't vote. You couldn't vote on college campus. You could not vote by lingual. All the, 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 it's the Johnson Revolution that led to, to 2008. Now I just want to say that I think that we do our sort of disservice and we do not study at least four of his critical speeches, the one at Howard, the one at Michigan, there are at least four critical Johnson speeches, because he went beyond freedom, one March 15, because freedom, we're, we're all free, but we're not equal. And what I mean by unequal today, that there's, there's not one Coca-Cola franchise, we free, only one Pepsi franchise, we free, uh, 22,000 dealerships, 200 black, we are free, uh, Apple, uh, HP don't have a single black on their board. We are free. We're not equal. Johnson addressed the issue. Johnson said, if you get free and have equality, you're not free at all. Johnson took us beyond freedom to equality. Friends, thank God. I just want to start preaching right now. Okay. Uh, later, Hoyer, what will it take? to try to get back, if we ever can, to bipartisanship. Come up. And then we go to Linda Robb. Well, I'm going to take a very short time between Jesse Jackson and Linda Robb, who is a wonderful, wonderful leader of our party and of our country in her own right as is her husband who served so ably in the United States and as governor of Virginia. The people have to decide that they want to elect a Congress who wants to work together. But the people are schizophrenic. On the one hand, they're asked, uh, what do you want the Congress to do? And they say, we want you to work together. On the other hand, they are asked, do you want your representative to stick to his principles? Absolutely. The contradiction of wanting to work together but stand by your principles depending upon what you interpret your principles to be. All of us want to stand by our principles. But in a democracy, Lyndon Johnson and Abraham Lincoln both knew the same thing. They had to compromise. They had to work with others who had a different perspective. And they had to urge them to come to their perspective. Same thing, Ben, you and I had to do as presiding officers of our respective legislative bodies. And so uh, the answer to your question is, uh, people ask me, when are you guys going to start to work together? I look them in the eye. Karen, I say, as soon as you do. As soon as you do. As soon as you demand of your representatives that they work with others, they'll do it because democracy works. But as long as in our country, uh, every night we repair to media that tells us to dislike the other guy, whoever the other guy is, as long as that is what we look at every night, we go to bed angry at the other person. I ask my members as whip, uh, particularly uh, as majority leader when we were in the majority, uh, that I wanted them to, to adopt the psychology of consensus. The psychology of working together to get to a place where democracy could work. And I think that's the answer. Could it even be done by LBJ today? Could it be done by whom? LBJ. Uh, I think in this context it would have been very difficult. I will tell you I've served in the Congress for 33 years. This Congress is the least productive, most confrontational, least willing to compromise Congress in which I've served. Lyndon Johnson did not have, as Nancy said, first of all, the extraordinary sums of money being spent by individual interest groups and single issue groups. I don't mean that there weren't angry people in the country, there were. I, I, I was working for a United States Senator during that period of time, just before I was elected to the state senate. 
I served on Lyndon Johnson's Youth Advisory Committee. Spencer Oliver got Watson to put me on. Remember that? Remember that? Charlie Weltner was on there. Adley Stevenson III was on there, a number of other people. Bronson LaFollette, La was it Bronson? Uh, Bron La a LaFollette was on there as well from Wisconsin. I think, my view, Barack Obama reached out his hand to work together. That's his style. That's what he wants to do. Uh, but the base of the Republican Party does not want people to do that. And while this is a recent Congress, in the TARP, the vote on TARP, which was, in my opinion, critically important for the uh, keeping America out of depression. That was in 2008. George Bush was president of the United States and two-thirds of the Republicans, based upon a hard-line philosophy, said no to Bush. And two-thirds of them voted against TARP. It was, it was Democrats, Jesse. It was Democrats voting with the Republican president, Republican secretary of treasury, and Bernanke, who said we're going to go into depression. So the answer to your question is, I think even Johnson, with his extraordinary skill, an extraordinary antenna, an extraordinary ability to know what the interests of the other guy he was dealing with was, uh, would have had great difficulty in this Congress uh, passing substantive legislation. Uh, I don't know whether John agrees with that or, no, or not. Agree. Thank you all. Linda Robb is next, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to be privileged. Linda. Oh, goodness gracious. Well, I would just like to say amen to everybody who's spoken. I don't know that I can say one more thing that is as important as what we've already heard. Um, and you know what Billy Sunday said, you don't win any souls after the first 15 minutes. <laughs> Another preacher, you know, had his way. But um, we were lucky. We who lived then, we lived in a revolution that was generally bloodless. Now, with ex with permission, with forgiveness, I ask, say that with John Lewis here. But when you consider what we all did together in the 60s, that, you know, we didn't fight with, with spears, we fought with votes. And we did do it across party lines. And the Republicans deserve a lot of credit for it. And um, uh, all the people who lived, all of those good-hearted people who lived all over this country deserve it. A lot of those people, you know, we think that, you know, the South gets this, um, everybody says, well, you know, the, all those bigots from the South. Well, let me just tell y'all, they were in Illinois too. I mean, <laughs> um, what, what Everett Dirksen did was, was very concerning. And not all of his supporters liked it either. And there were people who, uh, Republicans, who didn't like the fact that other Republicans um, um, were doing what they were doing. And, um, you know, Charlie Halleck, he lost his position as leader. And it was, it was a lot of that. And those people, those brave people who lived in those, those towns where when they went out and came to see mother and me, when we came through on the Lady Bird special and they went out and witnessed, they were there, black and white, not knowing or being willing to risk losing their jobs, losing their friends, losing the people that they loved at church, because they were willing to go and put themselves on the line. It's not just all these people in Washington. It's not the president. It's not all those fancy folks. Because to some extent, they can retreat back. But it was all of you who were out there who were willing to say, I believe this is right, and I'm going to witness for it. And I'm so glad that this is sponsored, co-sponsored by uh, Faith and Politics, because it was a lot of religious leaders. And it was a lot of people who 
were willing to put their own families on the line, uh, whether it be not just maybe uh, their lives, but their livelihoods. And I, I just want to finish with something that my father said. Right before he died, a month before he died, we had a big civil rights opening of the papers. That was what Daddy wanted to open first at the library. And a lot of wonderful civil rights leaders came. And, but it was very contentious, because guess what? We had some young people, black and white, who thought that those old folks, those um, uh, Roy Wilkins, you know, they don't understand. They don't have the real story. Because, you know, you're talking about the 70s now. And they wanted to fuss and everything. And Daddy was went, stood up and, and took a nitroglycerin pill, because his heart was going, and said, no, you've got to let these people talk. We've got to open this up to everybody. We've got to recognize that that is one of the things we have to do. And he said... Um, if our hearts are right, and if courage remains our constant companion, then, my fellow Americans, I am confident we shall overcome. And that's what we all have to think about. We all have to think that it's up to every one of us. It's not just up to John Lewis, who has gone over and over and over, and Andy Young, and so many of the, the people who came today. It's up to every one of us to see what we can do to make this a more equal America. Thank you. Now, I know that we have not had opportunity for questions. I continue to get strong suggestions uh, coming in. We do have, though, a wonderful panel. They are going to be with us uh, for the reception and, and available to you uh, for your questions. I hope you will stay with us as we go upstairs for it. Uh, Congresswoman, you want to uh, end it for us? Congresswoman Brown. Oh, Congresswoman Brown, please. Sorry. God is good. I know that you know John Lewis and Eddie Bernice Johnson, but you are probably wondering how Corrine Brown got to be a part of the program. Favor is not fair. And I want you to know that I want you to see someone that if it wasn't for Lyndon Bain Johnson, I would not be a member of the United States Congress. I want you to see a person, and I want all of the members of the Congressional Black Caucus to stand. All of them, come forward. I want you to see, come forward. Because how many members do we have? 43 members strong. And when you have the Congressional Black Caucus, then you have the Senate, you have the House, then you have the school boards. And let me just tell you, I've been in Congress. I was the first African-American elected to Congress in 129 years from Florida. It was not out of the goodness of anybody's heart. It was because of the Voting Rights Act, and I sued the state of Florida for four seats. The compromise was three. So that's how we got here. And if we're not careful, and if we don't work together, we can lose everything that we've gained. So our leaders have done their job. But when you're born, you get a birth certificate. And when you die, you're going to get a death certificate. And that dash in between is what you've done to make this a better place. We have other members of Congress here. Why don't all of the members of the Congress come forward? And, all and, and, of and the, the members. And the oh, I'm sorry. And in the Senate. Oh, goodness, my cousin Brown. Could let all of the senators come forward.
Ms. Johnson, she has a word to say before we go to the reception. No, sir. Mm -hmm. I, I just simply want to say we had some to come and leave uh, because of so many other things. Well, I, the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus has a fundraiser tonight, so she had to leave. Uh, you met uh, Congressman Jim Clyburn earlier, who had a book signing tonight. It just goes to show you that it's very difficult to have anything, any time, when all of us can be present. Uh, we come for short whiles and we leave. But I'm so grateful to all of you who, has, who have come. And I'm really grateful to these native Texans. I want the Texans to stand up. All right. <laughs> So if you are a proud American that believe that everything is possible if you get some boots and a big hat, you're a Texan. <laughs> but thanks to all of you for coming. I want you to know that we have the Congressional Black Caucus, which is uh, led at this time by uh, Marsha Fudge. We have the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation that's chaired by Chaka Fatah. We have the Congressional Black Caucus Institute that's chaired by Benny Thompson and the Congressional Black Caucus PAC that's chaired by Congressman Meeks from New York. We all try to coordinate and yes, we are Congressional Black Caucus, but we look out really for the world, but we especially look out for every American in need. And that's why we've earned the reputation of being the conscious of the Congress. We will be working very hard to see whether or not we can get a majority come November. But we have also put as a major agenda item to hold the Senate. That's right. Because the only way we can continue what Martin Luther King, President Kennedy, and President Johnson did together, we've got to work together. So we've got to elect people that can help us work together. I thank you all. I won't go any further. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Yes. Uh, when we think about the South, and I think about there's over 500,000 African Americans in Georgia that's not registered, there's it, no reason why it's 50 years past, the, the red South don't have to be red anymore. Maybe they haven't got the word that they can register and vote. Now, uh, my minister is here, Dr. Rudolph McKissick, Bishop. Why don't you come up and uh, say a quick prayer for us, and then we're going to go to the reception. Come up. You know, Favor, he's my bishop, and I'm calling him up. <laughs> Let us stand, please. Oh, God, our help in ages past. I hope for years to come, our shelter in a stormy blast, and our eternal home. We thank you for how you time our entire living. And you're blessing us to see that which was never meant to be by man but because of your divine providence, it is so. So now as we close out, thank you for allowing, allowing us to know that it is still the best that is yet to come. Amen. Amen. All right. And we have Ed Jennings, the regional director of HUD, and. I saw Miss Mel Watts here. Husband is director for federal. He controls the money, guys. <laughs> oh, the reception.